Hi everybody, uh, it's Amy Barron from I Was Supposed to Have a Baby. I'm so glad that all of you are here. I am really looking forward to bringing Dr. Batsheva Marcus to all of you this evening. She is one of the foremost experts in sex education and I am thrilled to have her join me. We were doing some um, technical uh, tryings out, quote unquote, uh, a few minutes ago, and I am just going to wait for her to come on here. Um, I have a bunch of questions that all of you have um, have sent to me, and we have a full program planned. But if any of you have any questions, feel free. Here she is. Feel free to drop it in the box. Um, down here and we will try to get to it during this session. Um, it is possible she's coming on in one second. Um, Hi there. <laughs> hey, and here she is. Um, it is possible, as we both adjust here, what yes. I was just telling everybody is that um, it's possible that there's going to be so much content here that you and I are going to have to do this again and maybe again. So we'll, we'll do this as as much as, as is needed and depending on the comments and the feedback from the viewers. But I am super excited about bringing you here. So thank you so much for being open and willing and available. So I'm incredibly, incredibly humbled and excited to have you. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks for having me. And I, I think the work you're doing here is amazing. So I, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, so let's just jump right into this. Um, I, everybody knows who you are, so I, I don't think I need to reintroduce you to this audience. Um, look, the, the, what, what we know and what you know is that I, I've had, in, in my audience and the people who follow me, I, it's come up over and over and over again that people struggle with their intimacy, with having sex, especially surrounding infertility and pregnancy loss. And there's so many different facets to it. There are, there, there's also infertility is very different than pregnancy loss and miscarriage and stillbirth. So there, there's, there's a lot of ground to cover, but I really wanted to sort of cede the floor to you and have you talk a little bit about sort of the generalities and the thoughts that um, people who come to you with these issues and their thoughts and their concerns and their questions. And then we can sort of merge into some other pointed topics that I've been suggested. Okay, I think, um, I think I'd like to start by talking about the fact that, um, first of all, I just need to say that I think it's awesome. Like it's very brave of people to be willing to share and talk and open up. I think it's critically important that people know that there's other people suffering with them and that, you know, this women talking to women thing can be incredibly powerful. Um, yeah, I, 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 I also want to start by saying that I think that it may be comforting for people to know that some of the issues that women who are going through infertility have in terms of like, not being interested in sex, or kind of feeling like it's a chore are not things that only women who are infertile go through. They, they may have it worse, or women who have pregnancy loss, they may have it worse, it may more be sort of more emotionally gut-wrenching, and they may feel it more, but right. that often those are issues that um, lots of women have for lots of different reasons. And, um, you know, if it's frustrating to hear that, you can kind of ignore it, but if it's if it gives you some level of comfort to know that, you know, lots of women who are, you know, perimenopausal or menopausal or just had a baby or are pregnant, um, or, you know, or, um, you know, people who, you know, people who are just in a relationship for a very long time, those are often things that people do have um, the same problems with. And so you should not always feel so alone in this because these are common, common problems and they may feel worse to you, but, but they are not so rare and you're not crazy and you're not broken and there's nothing wrong with you. And so I think that that's really, um, that's really, the important piece to start with. Right, and, and I think I also just, as a physician and also someone who speaks to, you know, dozens and dozens of women on a daily basis, I, I think the other point that I, I know that you're thinking about as well, because you see, you know, th this is your client base, is that it's not only at different points in terms of their fertility, meaning, you know, before, as they're trying to get pregnant or, 
after they've gotten pregnant or after they're perimenopausal. It's also in the course of a relationship and it, and it could be due to numerous outside stressors. It could be due to medical problems or age, age, age exactly. Medical problems or psychological problems or mental illness, sex. I, I mean, look, I'm not the expert here. Certainly you are, but based on everything that I know, sex is affected by all of those other factors as well. Which Correct is why, me if I'm wrong. You no, know, 100%, which is why it's often so complicated. And um, I, I, I often also want to start with this idea that we are told a little bit of a fairy tale, I think, um, you know, when we get married, that, um, that once we figure out the sex part, and some of us have a hard time doing that, it's not as natural as many of us think it is, we'll start with that. Like, I feel like I cannot tell you how many women come in and say, am I normal? And I'm like, I promise you, you're normal. You know, like, there's so many people in your situation. But we're sold this fairy tale that once you figure it out, like, that's it for the rest of your life, you know? Like, that's your sex life, the rest of life. And nothing, nothing could be further from the truth than that. Like, your sex life is going to change and evolve and develop, and there'll be dips, and there'll be things that are terrible. There'll be times that are terrible, and hopefully there are times that are really wonderful. So you, you kind of have to go in kind of knowing that, and that may make um, – that may make the bumpiness of this journey, especially as you're hitting some of these roadblocks right now, a little easier to bear. Like, Amazing. yeah. I, right? I, like, like, it's, it's, it's even, you know, as someone myself who's been married for 18 years and know, knowing that our relationship, you know, putting even aside our sex life has gone through ups and downs depending on, you know, the different stressors and the outside influences that we've gone through. I, I never even considered the fact that also our sex life also is something that, you know, should be, not it changes. I should, not to say should be, but it's natural it, that it would be doing that. It so. totally changes. You know, it's so yeah. funny. I was just doing a podcast with Shmuel Yankalovich, and I said to him, and I've used this analogy before, that think, imagine if they handed you a dress the day you got married, and I said, this is your dress. It's your dress for the next 60 years. And, like, it doesn't really matter if, you know, you, you, know, you get older, you gain weight, the style change, the, you know, the, the sleeves are now, like, you're just wearing this dress forever. Like, you'd be, that's ridiculous. It's, right. And for us to think that that's going to be the case with our sex lives is, so you being sort of in tune and understanding that your sex life is something you have to work on all the time is such a critical piece here. And, and if you have this fantasy that everybody else has this figured out and that you don't and that there's something wrong with you, you I'm telling you that this is not the case. Like thinking and working and, and focusing on your sex life is critical at every stage. Right now, the, the things you're going through that make it particularly difficult, um, we're gonna, let's talk about that. And, and, but know that there's are variations on the theme that you may have at other points in your life and small things. And so some of this is also developing mechanisms to cope that may really stand you in good stead over many years. Amazing. Thank you for setting that framework and that, you know, that, that, that cornerstone of knowing that all of us, all of us are going to struggle with this. And so now what? Okay. So, so now, so, what? now what? Exactly. So now what? So, so I think one of the big issues that comes up all the time is the issue of sort of t turning your brain on and off when you want your brain to get turned on and off. And, and that's really hard. And it's hard a lot of time in a lot of situations, but it's particularly hard, I think, when you're dealing with infertility issues or pregnancy loss. Um, you're distracted. You're thinking about something else. You may be very sad. Like you, this, you, it's very hard to kind of shift your brain. And so the two things that I have found that, and which is sort of two overarching realities, but then we have to talk about how to make that happen, right. um, that help is giving yourself some quiet time and space. And I know that's so much easier said than done, but giving yourself quiet time and space is one and laughing is the other and laughter. And like, if you can get yourself into a place where you're actually laughing and with somebody, um, even if sometimes it's with black laughter, like it just, it, well, because it releases hormones, I think, or because it sort of allows your brain to like kind of unplug from all of that or discharge some of that, that stress. So, um, you know, somebody, somebody wrote in, I think it was on your, on your, um, the, on the Instagram that she and her husband always go away to a hotel like the night before they have infertility treatments. Right. And I was thinking to myself, that is such a great, great idea. Because what I was going to say is you sort of take time, take time. And I know, like, I feel like time is the worst commodity in the society we're living in right now. But like a bubble bath with candles, it sounds so ridiculous. But if you can just take time for yourself, number one, really quiet. Maybe that's a walk. Maybe there's a walk outside in the green space. But like, say, like, 
for right now, for my marriage and for my sanity, I need this time. And if whatever's on the list isn't going to happen, that's fine. Because right now I need to either take a walk or take a bubble bath. So it's time for yourself. And the other thing is time with your partner, time with your husband. And that might be just lying in bed with each other and holding hands and talking. And I feel like that gets lost in the shuffle. The ability to kind of just make quiet time and space. You know, if you're one of those lucky people who meditates or does yoga, like go you, because that will make your life so much easier here. But if you're not, then just like learning to tune into the quiet time and space by yourself and with your husband is so important because it sort of quiets down like all of those voices in your head that are yelling at you. And, yeah. and um, you know, I, I could give you a, a 25 minute talk on like, stop yelling at yourself. Like there's, you know, cause you're gonna be yelling at yourself. Like, why didn't you do this? And could you have done this? And is this your fault? And the most important thing is to just be able to be kind to yourself, to really take the time, but, but make that time and space. Um, and on the flip side of that is like, if you find like a funny movie that the two of you can go together, if you, you know, try some maybe sexual things that you haven't tried before that just make you laugh, you know, um, right. you know, people talk about getting into a sexual rut. And one of the reasons they get into a sexual rut is because things work well, like this is very efficient, like we know how to have sex and it works well. But but that makes you not need to sort of connect and be as present. So if you try something a little crazy and a little different, be it a different position or a different room or um, or a game. You know, there are these dice games where you throw them and they say, try this position. You know, like anything that's going to make you kind of interact and laugh and sort of be able to be present, I think is going to be incredibly helpful in this situation. And then I'm going to talk about a third outlet, which I feel very strongly about. And I talk about this generally, but I think it's really, really, really important in this situation is fantasizing, like learning to move into your head. And, um, you know, I used to, once upon a time, talk to patients about like learning how to fantasize. And I would say, you know, find something to read or get an image in your head or story in your head that works and use it. Um, and people had a hard time with it. But what I realized is that um, I started call, you know, I started looking into this whole issue of neuroplasticity. I don't know if you're aware of it, but yeah. Yeah. So the but idea explain that, we, that explain that to the audience because I'm sure they're not aware of it. Yes, it totally I totally will. Long word, neuroplasticity. Yeah. This means that your brain can change and grow and develop. So if you're not good at math, for example, and you start doing math problems, yes, you'll get good at those particular math problems, but you'll also that part of your brain that is able to do math, those skills, those neurotransmitters, the blood flow, everything that's happening. In, those, in your brain is basically getting plumped up. Like that part of your brain, believe it or not, is getting stronger. Like we used to think once upon a time that your brain was static and like a machine, but it isn't. It grows and it changes and you can practice things. And the erotic, so that gave me a language to talk about sort of tapping into the erotic part of your brain. And many of us, especially from women, have sort of been told not to fantasize. Like we, we haven't been told that specifically, but it's just kind of in the ethos. In like the ta taboo of, you know, this is something we do not do. Right. Exactly. And that, that is so problematic. It is so problematic in any long-term relationship because heavens knows you're going to be with the same person for the rest of your life, please God, that's what we want. And so you're gonna have to be able to go to different places, different situations, and you're gonna have to be able to sort of use your brain to be able to fantasize. And learning not to edit yourself, like, you know, to be able to sort of be able to move into a fantasy. The best fantasies are what happens in your brain. I, I do recommend books as a starting point. I have on my Instagram, um, Dr. Bacheva, I do have, um, every Friday, I do Fantasy Friday, and I talk a little bit, I try to give a technique for like understanding how to fantasize, because Amazing. I feel like it's Amazing. the most underused tool. And I, especially for women and men at this point who have to basically perform at a specific time, right. like you need, whether you, you two of you share a fantasy, that's perfectly great. Or if you just move into your head in a fantasy, but that takes practice. Most of us can't just do that. I mean, you can't just snap and turn that on. Right. I mean, that's the idea. You want to get to a point where you can snap and turn on. And there's okay. many women who have like their orgasm fantasy. Like when you start talking to women who have orgasms easily, often there's some fantasy that gets them there and they keep that for a few months and that gets old and they might move into another one, some variation of that. Interesting. But okay. yes, but there is this idea that if you can get your head to be able to um, turn on to like an idea, a concept. In general, my experience is that men tend to be much more, um, their fantasies tend to, tend to be much more visual. 
things that they see, right? Like body parts. Those things. Women's fantasies tend to be much more situational, like a storyline. Um, and that could be, you know, and it, that could be any storyline. And the worst thing is to start editing your fantasies. Like you do not want to start saying, wait a minute, I'm fantasizing about women, but I'm not a lesbian. Like, who cares? It's a fantasy. It's in your head. It's not something you want it to happen. It's not something that should be right. like, there's no reality to this. You need to figure out what turns you on. And that is a little bit of a journey, but it will be a journey that will pay off so well for you. And if you can do that now, that this might be a good time to try to really learn that skill. And you can do that, you know, by yourself, really. Like that is really, and I feel like in the end, largely it's going to be so helpful to you in terms of being able to, so you take that bath before you have to have sex and then you start thinking about something that's really sexy and really turns you on. And all of a sudden you're like in a different place than you are. Right. So that you're saying, I, I mean, I think that this whole, the notion that you were talking about, um, you know, the, the number one and the number two, because number three is fantasy, but the number one and the number two about sort of giving quiet space for yourself. And, and I, like, I view that in the self care sort of, thought process and, and that module. And I talk about that. And we as a community in the infertility and loss community, we talk a lot about self care in terms of resetting yourself in general, when you've been through so much, you need to reach back and you need to come to a place of, of sort of self knowing and, and tune into the, to the pieces where your body or your mind or something is telling you, you need to stop and you just need to take stock of where you are. And what you're saying though, is that those exact techniques that you would do to sort of relax or disconnect from whatever else is going on that's incredibly stressful in your life also could have an added positive benefit to your sex life. That's effectively what you're saying. Exactly what I'm saying. I mean, your sexual desire is often, very often kind of a small, quiet voice. And if you don't make space to hear that voice, it's not gonna, you're not gonna hear it. So it, yes, the same exact, the same stillness that will allow you to kind of move inward and take care of yourself is often the same stillness that will allow you to reconnect with your desire. Amazing. I mean, because these are things that I talk a lot, a lot about on this page. And so, you know, it's, it's something that we're going to continue to talk about, but it's, I, I personally never knew that. And I think that it's going to be very helpful for everyone else as well. And I, I think that that second piece also about humor, about, I mean, we all know that humor adds to the endorphins and, and just gives you a whole new outlook on life. So you're saying that also it's part of the resetting. It just gives you that extra added oomph to sort of break you out of whatever you're normally it, doing. Totally. And if you can be laughing with your partner, like if you can laugh with your husband, like that is the best, especially, and I just want to say a word here that I feel like one of the things that's most heartbreaking to me when I see couples is that um, sometimes I feel like in their, in the sadness and in the frustration and in the pain that they're going through with infertility, they, they leave each other, not like practically, but they just, right. they, they, they lose sight of this other person in their life who, who they chose and they want to be with and, and who maybe sometimes things get tricky in terms of people understanding each other or not wanting to burden the other person. But when, when you're in a couple and both people feel so incredibly isolated, um, it just makes things worse. And one of the things that sex does is allows you to bring being together. I mean, one of the reasons I talk about sex in general in marriages and relationships is because I feel like it changes the tenor of the relationship. It's it takes you could be roommates, but you're these are partners. These, these are partners, and the one thing you do with your husband that you don't do with anybody else is have sex and allow yourself to be naked, both I mean emotionally and physically. And and when you are going through a rough time together, you will see. You know, I mean you don't want to lose sight of each other. You want, you really want to be able to connect to that person. Um, and, and this is a way to do that. So it's almost like you don't want to lose the other side of the rope. You know what I mean? Like you're both sort of grabbing onto that rope and you want to make sure that you're going to go and laughing together and sort of joking around together and saying like, let's try something a little crazy in the bedroom today. That's like a great way to reconnect, laugh, you know, get your door, like it does everything. And so it's really, it's, yeah, it's really something I think people need to be paying attention to. Okay. I, I mean, look, I, I, I just want to be cognizant of the time because it's 9.50. Um, I think what, 
you know, uh, what we're going to do is talk for about another 10 minutes uh, because I, I try not to make these sessions too long because I think it's too hard for people to listen for a lengthy period of time. And then if people, um, you know, if we don't get through everything we need to get through and if people still have other questions for you or for me, they can feel free to reach out afterwards and we'll, we'll do this, you know, we'll do part two. But, um, so let's, let's move on now to, so I think you, you, like one of a couple of the things that people asked about was, um, how to turn the anxiety off and turn on the passion. And I, I think that what a lot, those, those three techniques really do exactly that. I mean, obviously I'm sure there are lots of other things that you would talk to someone um, about one-on-one, -on -one, but those three techniques work for They're the, so across the, board. Of the the anxiety as yes. well. Yeah, I, I also want to throw in one more thing, which has come up over time about vibrators, toys in general, but vibrators in particular. Yep. Um, I always say that I think vibrators are one of the most underused um, tool in many women's sexual arsenal. Um, I'm talking right now about external vibrators, vibrators that go outside your vulva and outside your vagina that are meant to go on your clitoris, that are meant to help you have an orgasm or meant to induce pleasure. And especially when you feel like you're distracted or your head's in another place, um, vibrators can be a really nice way with you and your husband to sort of play to get you turned on. And the truth is, somebody was asking a little bit about men who have trouble as well. Vibrators can work for men also. Um, so, um, because it's a higher level of stimulation. And so, you know, I'm not going to go and I could literally talk to you for an hour about right. vibrators. I mean, I have, I have a three part free class. You can go on my website at my work website at Maze to, to look at that, but I'm, and I'm happy to come back again to talk about it. Um, but I do think that, um, again, this is a great time to like buy some new toys, you know, talk to your husband and say, like, what are some fun things that might be good for the two of us to try together? It might be a disaster, but at least you'll yep. start laughing. Do you know what I mean? Like, but it's, and it's also something new. So that also brings in the other piece as well. Totally. Ab absolutely. Um, I want to say one more thing. I'm sorry. I keep getting, like, adding. No, but please. I want to talk something about possibly taking a break, Amy. So, um, you know, I said to Amy before I came on tonight that one of the things that makes me kind of nervous about um, being on social media is that when I'm sitting one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I really can get a sense as to what their reaction is, like how they're feeling about the suggestions, all of these ideas and suggestions. It's very hard to do that when there's, you know, 40 or 50 people watching and everybody feels differently. So please, I'm asking you to hear me and realize that some things will work for somebody and some things will not. But um, I feel like taking a break, and I've seen this with patient after patient, like, again, if your relationship with your husband is important to you and you feel like the two of you are hitting like a breaking point, and I know that in the back of your head, you're thinking, oh my God, like I can't take a break. Like this has already been going on for two years and I want that baby, but and my biological clock is ticking and I can't wait any longer and et cetera, et cetera. But I want you to know that sometimes just taking a two or three month break where you say like, I am not, ha we are not trying to have a baby now. This next two or three months, we are going to be normal people without like this agenda item on top of our head and we're not going to worry about it and i'm just now i know it's easier said than done i can imagine you know like i just feel like people are like saying really it's so hard to do that it is hard to do that but it just takes the pressure off and taking the pressure off I, I, is so important on so many levels and for your mental health for your husband's mental health for the your relationship um and and you need to, you need to do that like you need to say to yourself it's okay. It's okay if it's this whole thing just gets put off for three more months. Um, and so I, I needed to like say a word about the break. Absolutely. There. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, I, I think this kind of um, morphs into one of the questions that I got, which was from a Jewish law perspective, from a halakhic perspective, people, people have asked, you know, can you choose not to be with your husband until you're ready? Um, or an, another like sort of Jewish law question was also just circling back to the toys. Like, are toys acceptable under Jewish law? And so I just wanted you to touch on sort of the the Jewish law aspect of, of some of these pieces. Right. So, you know, I try very, very hard never to, I, I don't give halachic right. answers or Jewish legal answers for anything ever because that's not my thing. You know, I... I, I'm a sex therapist. I'm not a, I'm not a halasis. However, having said that, I will tell you that I have talked to many, many 
many rabbis because sometimes patients have a hard time talking to the rabbis or they have they ask me to talk to them or the rabbis have a question about something they said so i will tell you that i have and and i deal with like satmer or like i deal with modern orthodox i deal with satmer like i really got across the board i've never had a rabbi say that a toy a vibrator that's like say not an old toy, but like a vibrator at least um was halakhically problematic. I've never had them say that. Um, I have also never heard them say that a woman has to have sex anyway. Somehow the women hear that. I feel like the women sometimes hear that from their college teachers maybe. Um, and, and maybe, and, and what I hear from the rabbis is, well, if they can figure out, like if they can give themselves, get themselves in the mood, that would be the best option. Um, but they certainly should never be having sex when they don't want to have sex. Like that is a really halakh thing. I feel like some of these are sort of secondary strains that come out from other, like, you know, ideas. Like, I've had Kala's tell me, that, you know, uh, women. I just, wanna, just for one second, Kala is a bride. Bride. Just, just right. to explain for everyone else. And yeah. Kala teachers are, so there right. are teachers um, who teach the, um, the, the engaged couple, sort of the laws that go along with marital intimacy after you're married. So when we talk about Kala teachers, we're talking about, the bride teachers or the husband teachers, the teachers for the for the um, for the husband. So I'm sorry, just continue. No, so yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Amy. So I, I I have heard women say that you know they have heard from their college teachers that they should have sex a certain number of times and you know a certain number of times a week or but more often than not, if you actually talk to the rabbis, they're going to say to you, no, you don't need to do that. You know that is not that is not a halachic issue. Um, so. Um, I have found that the more knowledgeable the rabbis are, the more allow, allowing they are. And so Always. Um, I, I feel like, especially in these times, and especially when it comes to infertility issues with couples, um, rabbis are usually, at least, again, in my experience, very kind of understanding. Um, so, um, yeah, so how do we get into, oh, I the the vibrators and the, um, and yes. the sex all the time. Yes, I, I think that that, but, Often people just put a lot of pressure on themselves because they feel like now I'm fertile. I, I really have to have sex now, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Look, I, I think that, that that's really an important point for everyone. Like, I, again, you know, we, we meaning myself and Bacheva, we are not rabbinic figures. We are, we are not here on high telling you what Jewish law is supposed to be and, and telling you what you should be doing. You should be you know, speaking to your own figure, the people in your life, your authorities and, and getting those answers from them. But I think your point about getting to someone who is an expert in this area, who really understands the nuances of the everything that's one, a couple goes through and a woman goes through when experiencing infertility, all of the different treatments, all of the different ways that she's made to feel physically and emotionally, and also all the ramifications and all of the issues that one goes through after having any kind of loss and sort of the disconnection that one can feel with her body, with her husband, with, with in general about, you know, the, the whole marital process in general. I think that when, when you get someone who is knowledgeable about these, these issues that come up regularly in our lives, then when you come to them with an issue and you come to them with a problem that you're having, then they're all the more so um, sympathetic and want to be able to be there and give you the leniency to be able to do things that bring the two of you close together. Because I think at the end of the day, like the thing that I was always taught throughout all of this is that the, the main role of a husband and wife and a couple to be together is is pru or vu is to have 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 a child ideally, but pleasure is also an incredibly important piece of it, and also it's not as if one is not allowed to have sex after menopause. So I I think that I when you find someone who's knowledgeable. And when you find someone who really understands human nature and understands all of these different nuances and these different procedures and experiences, then you get someone who, who really is much more in tune and can give you the appropriate answer for you. Right. And no, I think that that's 100%, that's 100% the, the, the way to go. Um, so, but I have found that rabbis are very understanding and very, and like toys are not, you know, really they again as long as it's between you know the husband and the wife they are really good with them like they want they want 
So let's just talk about pleasure for a minute because I feel like, um, you know, some there were some discussions in the discussion prior to this about the fact that, and I think this is true, that if, if your sex life felt like it was in a good place prior to all of this stuff starting, it will be easier, I think, for you to know that it will be okay when all this is, you know, please God behind you as well. And that is, I feel like very, very comforting for people. And so what I, what I would say is to you is like, no, like even if right now things feel like they're very rote, like yours a schedule and you have to follow the schedule and you're doing your best to make it like fun and interesting, but you know what? It's much harder than it sounds much of Like we're busy. We also have jobs and we have, you know, other responsibilities. So right. like we can't do other things all the time. And so I would say to you, like maybe say to yourself, it's okay if it's rote for a little while. It's okay if I'm just having sex when I need to have sex and it will be okay because I can't do everything and I can't fix everything right now. And so for now, for this year, for while we're working on this, it's gonna be a little bit rote. And so cut yourself a little bit of slack on that. You know, like we have, again, this very romanticized view about sex, you know? So, and you know, in a, in a weird way, and this is gonna sound so odd coming from a sex therapist to whom I think pleasure is like was all about, that women have it a little easier in this than the men because, you know, if they can't get themselves aroused and turned on, then they can't perform. And so, right. you know, it, but the men, exactly. Right. The men have a much harder time. If they can't hold an erection, they're going to really feel horrible about themselves. So, um, and I think sometimes the men, you know, again, I don't want to stereotype, but I find that men have a much harder time kind of expressing how scary this is, how fearful they are, how, how emasculated they feel. Like, and, and I feel like women, we, a lot of women feel like shame also, but somehow can sometimes reach out to other people. And so um, there is this idea that it's just going to be, it may just be rote for a while and that's okay. Like, don't beat yourself up for that. Like, it doesn't mean that your marriage is doomed and that, you know, you're never going to ever have a decent sex life because right now you're just having sex, you know, twice a week because that's what you need to do. All right. I think that that is, I mean, that, that really just goes back to the initial point of, you know, your sex life can change over the course of your life. And just because you're in a place right now where things seem more, more rote, as you say, or, or just more um, mechanical, that it doesn't mean that the, things can change. And people, and, and also all of these outside influences, maybe it's a difficult time at work. Maybe, you know, you're taking care of an ill mother or an ill relative. Maybe you have financial difficulties. There are so many other things that can cause incredible stress in your life that can cause you just to come in with a different energy into the bedroom. And so therefore, if all of those things are, are happening, then of course your sex life is going to suffer also. Correct. And, and, and you, can't, you, can't, you just can't be fighting all your battles right now. But the flip side of that is you can, you can you know, think about the things that allow you to get turned on and make sure that they're available. And that might be music. That might be dancing. That might be um, buying yourself some sexy lingerie. Um, that all might... suggestions that came up in the suggestion box. Yeah, uh... and, no, no, and 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 being able to kind of now here's an interesting thing about the sexy lingerie. I just want to say something very interesting because yeah. I think people think of it as being for their husbands, and I'm going to tell you that the reason I feel like buying yourself sexy lingerie is a good thing is because it makes you feel good and that makes you feel sexy, and that's a very very important distinction. Um, so, you know, I have found time and again that women often do really well when they go out and buy themselves something that makes them feel beautiful and sexy in, you know, in the bedroom. And so that I am a very firm believer in doing that. And again, I, I'm going to come back to the issue of vibrators, which I think can be an incredibly useful tool. You could also try different lubricants because it might be fun to experiment um, or get yourself some kind of game, um, you know, some sex game to play with your husband. Um, okay, so, so being very practical for a second, and I'll just say just because I've been traveling and my time is a little warped, I thought we were much further along in our time period than we are. So we still have time, so we're good. Um, <laughs> Can you practically, you mean, you're talking about vibrators or toys, you're talking about games. Okay, where do you get them? Like, how do you, like, 
are you just walking into a store? Do you, I mean, I mean, what, nobody like, walks what into the a box? store anymore. Like, like what, what, what about these boxes? Like, what if somebody sees? I mean, I'm asking all the questions yeah, no, that everybody's going to ask. So, like, totally. where so, do you get them? So, uh, first of all, you know, we live in a time where nobody goes into stores anymore. So, like, I, you know, so I'm going to tell you there's something called the Gottman app. You know the Gottmans? They do a marriage how counseling. Do you spell, how do you spell that? G O T T M A N, Gottman. Okay. okay. Um, they're marriage counselors. Um, and they created this Gottman app, which we love. I think it's just adorable. Um, it's, um, it's like all kinds of questions to ask each other and fun things to do together. Um, so that's a great, that's a great, you know, app to kind of start with. Um, there's, um, if you're interested more in fantasies, um, there's an app called Dipsy, D I P S E A, um, which has, um, I'm stories. writing it down so that we can, so that I can write it after D I P S E A. Yeah. Okay. It's an, it's an app online and it's, um, erotic stories and you can kind of pick, do you want something kind of more vanilla or something a little bit more crazy? Um, okay. and it's, and it's audio and then they have actors okay. reading it. So it's actually, for women, I feel like it's that's a great way to go. Like we used to joke around in my office that we should be creating this, so I was like so happy that somebody actually <laughs> did create that. Um, and then and then there's online. There's just you can go and just type honestly, just type in sex games. There is on the Upper East Side. If you happen to be in New York, the Kosher Sex Shop. Have you been aware of that? I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. Talk, Shmuley Botaf's daughter. Shmuley Botaf's daughter um, okay. um, opened the Kosher Sex Shop. Um, and she has just a million things. It's just, it's a very, like, it's very, um, it's not like, it's not like it's a lot, everything on that has a lot of stamp of approval. Right. I don't, you know, right. um, but it's, um, but it's, it's like kind of, it's like nice. It's upscale. It's nice. It's quiet. Like, you don't not sleazy. Is it's just nothing, saying. nothing sleazy about it. Exactly. Right. Um, but as I said, there's these dice games, which uh, people find like they're fun because they're like three dice and they have different variations. Like, um, um, something to say, a position, and something to wear, or something, and then you okay. have, so you throw the dice, and you have, mostly because I think it makes you laugh again. Like this is you're not going to have the best sex of your life doing any of these games, but you will reconnect. And um, so there, and you know, you, there's again, there's different kinds of lubricants, and there's different kinds of smelling things you can put in the bath, um, and trying these things out is like explore anything new that gets your brain off of the fact that you know you need to be having sex on Tuesday and Thursday or Monday and Wednesday right. is right. where is really where you want to be going so um that could be you know a new like as I said like a new night something you're wearing like a new nighty or a teddy or something that makes you feel really good about yourself I, I here becomes the issue of like, I know people sometimes feel really bad about their bodies while they're going through. And I think you need to learn to be nice to your body. Like your body is doing a lot of good things for you, even though you may be angry at your body at the moment. I mean, I don't know, Amy. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I you know, I, one of the things like women often have a lot of shame about their bodies in many instances. In general, correct. In, Without in general. bringing in, in infertility and loss. Correct. And, then when the infertility and loss kind of comes in, they're like feeling like freaking out. Like this body is somehow not doing what it's supposed to be doing and it's betraying them. People feel betrayed by that. This is what I want to say to you. Like, if you can be nice to your body, like your body is trying its best for you. And um, we do, we give our body a lot of beating up in lots of different ways. And um, the more you can make friends with your body, the better off you will be in the long run. So, um, you know, when you hear those voices in your head, and it's very practically, when you hear yourself, that, you know, getting angry at yourself, just take it easy. And some of that may be buying, again, something that makes you feel beautiful because you are beautiful. Whoever you are and wherever you are, you are beautiful and you are unique and there's nobody else. The only thing you can be the best at is being you. And you should as best as you can, try really hard to embrace yourself. And that means physically putting your arms around yourself and giving yourself a hug. Like that is really an important thing to do. Amazing. I think, I think specifically, you know, specifically for couples who are, who are, you know, going through the different hormone shots for infertility, you know, when, when that causes bloating and weight gain and nausea and headaches and mood swings, it's your body feels like it's not your own. And so, how much more so for someone who's going through that. And then also in these specific situations when someone has an unexplained loss where you feel that your body has just failed you 
and the pregnancy that you hoped was going to, you know, you were going to hold in your arms in nine months just is, is not there anymore. Um, it's, it's yes, being, being hard and being, um, you know, being, being, being really just feeling ashamed and feeling sort of putting blame on your body is really what so many people do. And they feel like they're just having this sort of out of body experience. And so this connection that you're talking about is really so important for someone like that. And, and I will say that's another moment where I think you get a choice to turn towards your partner or away from your partner, right? Like you are feeling so sad and so alone and so isolated and being able to turn towards your partner to be able to cry and express that and be held is really important. And I see couples where they're trying to be strong and so they're just not talking and sharing with each other. And, um, and each of them ends up feeling so, so incredibly isolated. So, um, you know, the men are feeling like lousy that they can't either help the woman or that their sperm isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. And she's feeling like my body's not doing it. And, and so really being able to like reach out and honestly, often that is often what also adds to the ability to connect sexually, because if you can really be there with the person and really like let yourself be held in all and emotionally as well as physically, then it makes it much easier to let yourself be touched and okay. kissed and right. pressed and, um, and, and, and let me say, I'm going, I feel like I'm going a little bit in circles, Amy, and I apologize for that. But no, I, no, I, no, no, I, the, I think a, like a lot of this is circular because so many of the themes and the different techniques overlap, but the, keep going. going that, 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 that if you, if you are having a bad day and you curl up with your husband and you just cry and then you let it out and you then go slow and now, you know, it's almost like the storm is through and you're allowing yourself to be in your body and take it slow, like kiss slowly, touch slowly, focus on the other person, you know, often then the arousal can come out again. There's the quiet and the space and the time. And, you know, I, I will say to couples often in many situations, like just go slower, just take it slow, sit with each other with your lips barely touching for you know, 20 seconds and just feeling the breath and be available to do that. And then desire kind of has a space to grow. It may not be the strongest desire you've ever had. It may feel different than when you were, you know, 21 and you just got married and you didn't have all this baggage. But that is where it's it's like that little garden of shoots. If you let them kind of come up, it allows them to, to, to sort of experience. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, Okay, let me, let's just close with one last thing, which we talked about a little bit before, but what, what do you say as your thoughts to the couples that are on one side or the other side experiencing low libido, whether it's because of everything that they've been through because of the infertility loss, or it's just something inherent, whether it's the male or the female, what, what do you do mm -hmm. in that situation? I think one for, for that person who's experiencing the low libido and also for the partner who's experiencing all of this rejection and doesn't know how to handle it. So low libido is, it's a huge problem. Like it, a lot of people have that and people have it worse when they're going through infertility. So there's no question about that. But I will say, I will say this. Some of libido is a decision to have libido. I know that's just not what we think of as romantic, and that's not what we think of as um, the way it happens in fairy tales. Like I should just spontaneously want to have sex, much of it, but that is not the reality for most couples. So you have a harder hurdle in some of these cases, but it's it's like a decision. I want to want to have sex, and then that means doing some of the things we talked about very concretely: slowing down, starting to fantasize bringing out, you know, toys, um, you know, reading something erotic, reading something erotic together, possibly. Like, it's the decision to make, to, you know, it's so interesting. There used to be, used to be, once upon a time. So, you know, um, Masters and Johnson always had this desire model where, like, you started with spontaneous desire for sex, and then you got turned on, you introduced all the stimulus, and you got turned on, and then hopefully you right, had right, an right. orgasm, right? And then, 
I don't know, maybe about 15 or 18 years ago, Rosemary Bassan, who's an OBGYN in, um, in Canada, flipped that on its head. And she said, that doesn't describe most of the women I know. Most of the women I know make a decision that they want to have sex and they introduce the stimulus as first. So first you're like doing the kissing and the touching and the reading and the thinking and the fantasizing. And then you then you start getting turned on and only when you get turned on, then the desire kicks in. Right, so that's the arousal desire. It's like a flip, and so you have it worse in this situation. But but that's a, again, I hate to say the word skill that we all need to develop. It is a skill that we all need to develop because you know over many years, this, some of the same things kind of you know come in again. And so you have you have to trust that you have the ability to turn yourself on, and turning yourself on will kick in the desire. Now, yes, at some point you know, medications or hormones may be something, but now that you can't do those things and you have all these other things pouring in. But what you can do is you can practice with your brain and make that happen. You can slow things down. You can make the decision that I want to get, I want to be, I want to desire and I'm gonna let myself get aroused first and that will kick in the desire. Does that make sense, Amy? Absolutely, absolutely. But then I guess the question is what about what about when that person is not yet utilizing all of those techniques as they, because they haven't seen this talk or they haven't, you know, spoken to their own sex therapist. So they're still in this place where they still have low libido and, and it's really difficult. So what about the other partner? What, what do you say to them? So, you know, I, I, this is not something I can answer like with a one sentence. Like in other words, I feel like the problem is that understanding that when your part, when somebody is living with somebody or married to somebody who has low libido, it's it's almost shattering. It's gut shattering because it feels like you don't feel wanted. It's not that you can't have sex. Like honestly, that seems like the least piece rejection. of shit. It, it feels like, like a rejection. It's a it's a not only rejection. It's a rejection of the most elemental piece of who you are. Right? This person doesn't want you. And you know, sometimes I'll talk to women and they're like, "Well, why doesn't he understand that? I just it's not him. I don't have any problems with him. I just don't want to have sex with anybody. I'm just not like feeling sexual." Right. I'm like, well, if you imagine for a minute how you feel if he didn't want you, if there's something about not wanting to be intimate with somebody, not wanting to have sex with somebody that makes you feel like basically you're not wanted, you're not seen, you're not wanted. And so um, that's why I, I feel like I can't answer that question without going back to the fact that the decision to say like, yes, you know, I hear that. I totally hear that. And I love you. And so I'm going to, maybe we'll do it less frequently. Maybe we'll do some kind of combination. And this gets tricky when you're going through infertility treatments, but you may say, look, I can't, I, I don't want to have sex three times a week or four times a week. I can't do it, but I love you. And I'm going to work on myself enough to be able to get turned on and want you not just lie there, but want you and be part of that once a week because I love you and I see you. Um, I also feel like, and this, this will be, a, you know, I know we're running out of time now. Um, we, we should have another time where we're talking about how to schedule sex and how to schedule not sex, because yep. I feel like that is such a powerful, powerful, powerful tool, but it's, you know, I think we're supposed to be done. So I, I can't take another five or 10 yep. minutes to talk about that. that I, I'm so we should have, down for the next time. It's all we good. should definitely talk about how to schedule not sex, which is a huge issue. Yep. And better vibrators and I'll bring some home and I'll talk about them. Okay. And also now is the time if you're having pain, get like, see somebody, you should not be having pain with intercourse. You just need to say that. And you know what, if, if you're trying to get pregnant and you're miserable and you're having pain with intercourse, you don't deserve that. Do, do yourself a favor and get yourself help. I, I actually just got a message about that a couple hours ago and I, 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 I haven't had a chance to respond to that follower yet, but you're a hundred percent right. If it's hurting you, then there's something wrong and go get help because it should not be hurting you Correct. at all. And if you see a doctor and she says to you, I, I, there's nothing wrong, I don't see anything, see a therapist, find yourself another doctor because there, it, if you're having pain, Correct. there's a reason you're having pain. The muscles may Correct. be tight and she doesn't see them. Correct. You know, there's something going on there and you have the right Hi, to Rachel. have pain for you. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, I, I think we're going to, let, let's close out now. I, look, we we have, you know, we, we've touched on a lot of different points. There are so many different pieces that each person can bring to the table and whether they're interested, whether they're not interested, whether they themselves feel like they're ready, whether they're not ready. And you've given us so many different techniques that 
each piece, each, each part of the couple can work on to try to build the relationship and come back together, even during these very difficult times. And I'm so grateful for your presence here and your voice and your experience. Um, and this, this, all of this will be saved right here on my, um, on my, channel i'm i'm losing it for a second i on this handle for 20 uh, for 24 hours but then it will be saved to youtube so anyone can watch it at any time so if you miss it because of shabbos and things are getting difficult as we're going into the weekend it will be saved so you can see this at any time and if anyone has any follow-up questions for myself or for but dr bacheva mark you could just call me bacheva that's fine. okay <laughs> i i i can but i don't know about everybody else so <laughs> um please message either one of us and we will answer you the best that we can. Um, closing, closing thoughts from you. You might closing thoughts are just stay strong. Um, you know, please God, this too will pass. This time in your life will be over. Um, and you will be in this relationship for a very long time and your sex life is going to be with you. And if you can't deal with it right now, you will deal with it eventually. And you're going to muddle your way through this. Like all of us are doing just the best way you can. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank and thanks you. for having me and letting me part of this conversation. That's so I, I, important. It's, it's, it's my honor. I Part two, coming up soon. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll, we'll see you soon. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.